Good morning, everybody. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You're supposed to say good morning back. I was led to believe you have a very, very good level of English, but we seem to be on unit one. Good morning. Good morning. Or <laughs> well, afternoon, I don't know. You decide. This is my first time in Serbia, my first time in Belgrade. Um, I'd like to thank... Um, the people have been so welcoming and inviting me, uh, Lisa and Gordana and Vlad and Pella. It's fantastic reception they've given me and they've really looked after me. So thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here because I'm quite old and I've never been to Serbia, which is a shame, isn't it? I think. And I've met some of you um, in the break time as well and found out a little bit about your lives as teachers as well, which is very interesting too. And maybe later I'll have a chance to meet some more of you too. Um, I did say good morning, ladies and gentlemen, but I don't notice many gentlemen here. I don't mean the, the men who are or aren't polite. I mean there just aren't many men. Uh, is this something about Serbia, that you just don't have any? Or are they at home cooking you some lunch and cleaning the house? Is that what it is? Yeah, it's that one. Anyway, we can, we'll manage without them, yeah? Is the volume okay? It's not too loud or too... It's the first time I've used one of these in um, giving a talk like this. One of my fellow presenters suggested it made me look like Madonna. I don't know how, but the last time she saw a picture of Madonna, but <laughs> I hope this hasn't happened to Madonna. I know she's had some plastic surgery, probably. Perhaps if I put on a cone bra, you would, we would be indistinguishable. Okay, I'm going to talk about coaching. My talk is called uh, Give Your Teaching the Coaching Twist. Okay. Um, this guy is quite well known here, apparently. Uh, so I'm given to understand, is that right? You know the guy with him? Yeah, who is he? Yeah. Yeah, and the guy with him is... Yeah, Menem Bayrak is coach, exactly. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about is that, really, how I think teaching English is like tennis, and how I think teachers can be like Marian Bayrak a bit more than we are, and think about all our students as Novak Djokovic, yeah? People who have agendas, aims, objectives, and dreams with English, and how we can help them do that, okay? I'm also going to, apart from talking, I'm going to get you to do some work together, okay? Now, I was speaking to uh, one of the teachers in the break, and she said, you know what, Duncan, we love about this conference is we come and we just listen to you talking, and we don't have to do any of that pair work or group work nonsense. Now, I, obviously, I'm not going to share the name of that person, but Liliana, I'm sorry, we are, Lilia. We are going to have to do that because I can't talk for an hour without losing my voice and becoming very, very boring, okay? But we'll have a mixture, okay? Okay, right. So that's Novak Djokovic. That's me. Oh, well, that's where I'm from. I, I work in Barcelona. I'm the director of a language school which is called Oxford House, and the teacher training part is called Oxford TEFL. Uh, there it is in Barcelona. There's some students. Can you see it? The picture's gone a bit weird, but anyway. Um, the staff room. And uh, the picture at the bottom is a conference. We have a conference, too, every year in May called the Innovate ELT Conference in Barcelona, and there is everybody in the garden listening to, to a plenary speaker there. Um, so if you're interested, uh, uh, that's what we do. And that's what I do. And so my interest in coaching isn't because I'm a professional coach or I did a course to become a professional coach. I just started reading about it uh, and thinking about it. And I guess a lot of my work I feel is like coaching because I have to meet other people in the team, teachers, directors of studies, uh, and managers in the school. And that's kind of how I work with them. And I started thinking about how that applied to teaching. Um, and, oops, wrong one. And I met a guy called uh, Dan Barber, and he wrote a book three or four years ago 
called From Language Teach From English Teacher to Learn a Coach. Has anyone ever read this book? Nobody. Great. Uh, I mention it, it's a shameless plug, because the talk is based on the book and it's an ebook, so you can get it online for about five euros. Yeah, and it's got activities for students and a lot of uh, explanation about how I think and how Dan thinks coaching can become part of our teaching now and in the future. Um, so you can just go online and get that. I'll give you the references at the end, yeah? I'll also give you my email address, and I have some cards here, so if you want to write to me or contact me, you can if you've got any questions. All right? We may have time for some questions here, but I think it's awkward to do questions at the end because you don't have a mic, and I do. And, but what you can do during the talk, if you think of something that you want to ask me a question about, or something you didn't understand, or, or you want, just write it down on a piece of paper, and then maybe at some point when I'm walking around, I can collect the pieces of paper, and then I can read out the question. Do you see what I mean? Yeah? And if not, just find me later if there's not time for that. All right? The deal? Okay. I'm going to mix up activities with kind of explaining the rationale, okay? And rather than give you a long sort of speech about what I think coaching is and what it isn't, I'm going to start by getting you to answer these three questions, which I think are key, and which I call coach questions. Okay? So what you're going to do is think of a student you teach. Yeah? Yeah? Now, I know you have quite big classes, a lot of you, yeah? How many students in your class? 30, 40? 36. Very precise. 36. <laughs> Not 37. 36. <laughs> okay. Anyway, between 30 and 40, so it's quite a lot. <laughs> uh, and here's the three questions I want you to think about. What do you know about the English language life? What I mean by uh, English language life is, of course, they come to your class and they speak English. That's the part of their English life that you know. Yeah? But what about the bit that you don't know, or at least happens outside class? Maybe they listen to music in English. Maybe they watch TV in English. Maybe they have some friends they write to, or they're in a, a, a Facebook group that uses English. Who knows? Uh, what they do in English. Maybe they talk to their parents or some friends. There are all sorts of possibilities. And I think the first thing a coach needs to do is think about not just what they do with the students in class, but how the students are getting towards their goals with English. And we're just part of that in most cases. Maybe for younger children, we're a bigger part. Maybe that's all they do, but maybe not. You know, maybe at home their parents are putting cartoons on in English, yeah? For them to listen to. Or maybe they go to another English class with a private teacher. I don't know what they do, but so that's you don't have to think of one student, yeah? It's very important you think of one student. Very often when I ask people to do this activity and I get feedback, they talk about their class. They say, My students and my students and most of them and some of them and none of them, I don't want you to do that. In fact, if I hear you doing that, I'll be very angry. I'm gonna monitor and I'll come round and I'll I'll tell you off, okay? Uh, so just talk about one student, because that's the whole point of coaching, to stop thinking about our students as a blob, but think of them as individual people. Yeah? They're all Djokovic. The second question is, what are their goals? So you think of this student, and then you think, what are their goals? What is that student's goal? Even if they're six years old, they have a goal. Maybe their goal is to draw a picture of God and explain it to you in English. Maybe their goal is to play a game in English. Maybe their goal is to listen to rap music in English or travel to another country where English is spoken and use it there. They've got goals, haven't they? Or maybe they have to pass an exam, the school exam to get to university. How are they progressing in relation to these goals? So you're imagining this student, and if you said to her now, well, yeah, where are you? Can you understand all the lyrics of that rap song? Can you draw a picture of God and describe it in English? And thirdly, what is stopping them reaching their goals or slowing them down? This is perhaps the most important question. 
Because English learning is like any other endeavor. It's like giving up smoking or something like that. We all have intentions, but sometimes those intentions don't get carried out. Things stop us. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later. So what's stopping them reach their goals or slowing them down? Maybe they have uh, insecurities about speaking in front of other people in the class. Maybe they think they're not very good at languages. Maybe at home they don't have a very good environment or any encouragement. Maybe you, the teacher, are not encouraging them. Or maybe they're doing things in class that don't really help them. They help some of the other students. We were talking about this yesterday um, with, with, with some of the other speakers and with Lisa. People learn languages in different ways. And it was quite interesting that some of the people around the table said, uh, at school, I didn't, that didn't help me to learn language. I'm not saying you're bad teachers or we are bad teachers, but some of the students in our class are not benefiting as much as others. And there may be another way they can learn. So what's slowing them down? And what could they do to overcome these obstacles? Yeah, I get home and it's no good because I don't know where to find English or I can't practice because it's very noisy in the house. Uh, or I don't know anyone I can practice speaking with. Or, yeah, I kind of start, but then I get distracted. I go and look, try and look at a website in English, but then I start talking to my friends on WhatsApp or, or Facebook, and I don't do it. So these are obstacles, and you can start thinking about what they could do to overcome. Okay, so the task is now to talk to the person next to you. It's a pair activity. And first of all, you'll, ask, well, you'll agree which one of you will talk first. And you're going to talk about how many students? One. One student you teach, okay? And discuss these questions. And I'm going to give you three minutes and 45 seconds, okay? Off you go. Wow. It's funny, when I said stop, you just carried on. But when I did that, as if I was going to fly off the stage or something, I guess you were anxious or worried or... It's funny that, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it was nice that you didn't want to start. It's a conversation that obviously can go on for a long time. Uh, we don't have time here, but you can continue it afterwards on the bus home if you want or, or wherever, or with your colleagues. I think it's a really, really important conversation. Did, and hopefully you kind of started thinking about things, about your students in a different way maybe. Haven't got time to get feedback, or we can't really in this uh, scenario. But remember, if you've got a question or a comment about an activity, then you can just write it on a piece of paper and we'll collect it a little bit later, yeah? So just jot it down. Uh, I said we would talk a little bit more about obstacles and how you overcome them and how important that is. The things that stop people learning English. I think we obsess too much as teachers about the methods we use and what we do in the classroom and the activities. And we could spend a little bit more time thinking about the students and whether they're reaching those goals and what's stopping them. And that can be at the level of the classroom, so maybe in the activity and the thing you're doing, there's something that's stopping them. For example, if there are 30 students in the class and you're correcting their homework by going round one at a time, there are lots of students not doing very much, so that might be a way they're stopping. But there may be other things outside that's stopping them practice. So it can be what goes on in the classroom or outside. Or maybe they're doing lots of conversation activities, but they're not convinced by that. They think, well, I'm just making mistakes, talking to other students. I want to talk to the teacher. So all sorts of things. This guy is um, called Timothy Galway, who was a famous tennis coach. Um, can you read that text? Because I can't. I'm terribly short-sighted. But have a look at it and read it, because if you're a presenter, you're not supposed to read the text. But I actually have a feeling I would like to read it. Because <laughs> I'm going to, okay? It says, in every human endeavor, there are two arenas of engagement, the outer and the inner. The outer game is played on an external arena to overcome external obstacles to reach an external goal. Okay? So he's talking about Djokovic trying to win Wimbledon, win a tennis match, uh, by getting more points, hitting good backhands, serving fast, etc. That's the external arena, yeah? 
The inner game takes place when the mind of the player, uh, in the mind of the player, and is played against such obstacles as fear, self-doubt, lapses in focus, and limiting concepts or assumptions. The inner game is played to overcome the self-imposed obstacles. Oops. That wasn't good, was it? Oop. Bring it back. The self-imposed obstacles that prevent an individual or team from accessing their full potential. Timothy Galway was a tennis coach. So this idea that Djokovic is playing two games. He's playing Federer or Nadal, but he's also playing himself in his own head. And in fact, the work of most tennis coaches, I think, is that. Uh, perhaps more than working on the back, backhand, especially at that level. But your students are the same as Djokovic. And we all identify with that, don't we? No? When I read it, I was thinking, good grief, yeah. Fear, self-doubt, lapses in focus. That's me, that's you, that's all of us. Um, and that's what's stopping your students getting f as far as they could. More than whether you explained clearly the present perfect versus the simple past. Not that that may not be helpful, but in the big picture, it's not as important. What can we do about this, though? We're not therapists, are we? So, well, let's see. So that's Timothy Galway, the inner game of tennis, he called it. And that's Marianne Vajda. He, got, he, he rejoined, he, he sort of um, started working with Djokovic, I think, about 18 months ago. 2018, he, he had a different coach, Djokovic, and um, he was interviewed. He said, I told him, you have it inside you, but now we have to find our daily routines again. Now we have to face these tough moments. Okay. I think that's an interesting quote because it, it kind of supports what I'm saying. You have it inside you, but also the idea of finding routines. Uh, it's actually quite concrete. Coaching is about that. We're going to have a look at that. One thing you can do with your students, if they are older students, or I think with your colleagues, if you are teaching very young students in primary, is to go through this GROW model. Can you read that writing? No, it's too small, isn't it? That's not good. Okay. GROW is an acronym that stands for Goals, Reality, Opportunities and Obstacles, and the way forward. That's the G-R-O-W. There's two O's, okay? And it's a way to structure a conversation with yourself or with your students. Uh, what do you want to be able to do in English are the questions under goals. What level would you like to achieve? Do you need to pass an exam? What an ex exam? So these are questions your students are asking yourself themselves, but you could ask them too. Or they could ask each other. The reality is where you are now. Yeah? I want to pass the IELTS level seven. Well, at the moment, you're really at IELTS level four, and you will need to do this and this, yeah? Where are you going to go? The opportunities and obstacles are interesting because this conversation will help your students think not just about coming to class regularly, but also the other things they could do to improve their English, yeah? Um, can you attend classes? Uh, can you practice on your own when and how? What things can you do at home on your own? Because you can only, even if you can afford classes, you're only going to do two or three hours a week, maybe, if it's a private school, or if you're in a public school, maybe the same. So what can you do? Obstacles. How much time can you dedicate to English? How much money? And are you confident you can succeed? So we're back to the self-doubts. And in this conversation, well, actually, no, because I started learning English before, and it was terrible, and I didn't like the teacher, and then I left the class. People have all these things, or I'm too old. They say I'm too old. I'm too old to learn English. Or I'm not very good at languages. Yeah, we've all met students like this. And then you can agree on a way forward, having considered all of these things. What's your best strategy? And you can, you can write down some options and set some goals. So that's a sort of conversation you can have. You're now going to say to me, well, Duncan, I've got 36 students. Yeah? How can I do this conversation with 36 students? Were you thinking that? Yeah. Because it's all very well for Djokovic. He's got a private coach, hasn't he? They can just talk. What you can do is cascade 
or delegate. So maybe you have the conversation with one of your students in front of the other students, yeah? And you demonstrate it like you do with a language teaching activity. And then you put your students in pairs, like I put you in pairs just now, and they can have this conversation with each other. Maybe in English, depending on their level. Maybe partly in Serbian and partly in English. If not, that's okay. And then they can report back and share. So it, it, it can be an activity like that. It doesn't have to be private. If you work in a language academy where maybe the classes are smaller, sometimes there's eight students, you can have a sort of take one student out at a time type approach as well. But it's doable. And I think if you're teaching very young students, like five or six-year-olds, who maybe are too young to have that conversation, I would have that conversation with my colleagues. Yeah? What are the goals of these kids? Is their goal to learn these words to describe this thing or that thing? Or is their goal to draw a picture of God or whatever they want and talk about that? Or is their goal to understand cartoons and children's programs in English? on television, yeah? Or is their goal just to be integrated in the class and feel like they're okay at English and they don't feel embarrassed or worried or scared? Yeah, I mean, you can think about when you would have those conversations and who with. I've kind of answered those questions a bit. But I think it's important because often people make that objection, right? They want coaching is one-to-one. -one. We, we can't do that. Yes, we can. But you can think about how you would organize that in your class. How long would you spend on it? We've got to get through the syllabus. They have an exam. We can't have students talking about their goals and their feelings. It takes too much time. Well, I think it's time well spent, and it doesn't have to be a long time. So I think there are three things that a coach can do. And here, we carry on with the acronyms. We've had GROW. I'm going to test you on them at the end, by the way. I hope you're taking notes, yeah? Can you remember what GROW stands for? Goals, reality. Excellent. Okay, now we've got the, the coaching mop, as Dan and I called it. Three things a coach does. There are things teachers do, but maybe we could do them a bit more. They motivate, they organize, and they practice. So the motivation is the inspiration to get the students there to the class, to make it a, a place that's productive, fun, warm, accepting of them. Because if the students don't come to class, then it's really pointless what you do. And I think, again, as teachers, we often don't focus on that enough. How many students actually come to the class? Obviously, if you're in a state school, then they're, they're obliged to be there. But if you're in a, a private academy, then how many are coming? Voting with their feet. And then we organize the students. And that's what the co uh, Djokovic's coach was saying, wasn't it? You know, we've got to get the routines. How do we set, help them set goals and monitor their achievements? If they say they're going to listen to a song every week to practice, do they do that? And do you check? Or do they check with each other? What English have you done this week? Not just formal homework, but informally. Why not? And practice. That's what we do in the classroom. We help them to practice in that moment. But the point of coaching is to think not of the lesson as the end in itself. The lesson is part of the student's endeavor to learn English, which, let's face it, they can do without the class. They may find other ways, and many do. So we're not the whole story. We're part of it. And I think it's useful for us to know what the rest of the story is. There's a thing in England called Weight Watchers. Do you have something like this? No, no, no. no. Weight Watchers is a club. When people want to lose weight, they go to this kind of club or a meeting, like a group, and they go to the group, and there's a group leader, and then they talk about their diet, exercise, routines, they weigh, and they talk about what they've done and what they haven't. Um, but they don't lose weight in the Weight Watchers. It's not like they sit there in, in, a, in a kind of hot, <laughs> do hot yoga and eat yogurt for an hour or something like that. Uh, that's what they do afterwards. And I think language teaching is and will be even more like that, that we're there to help set them set goals for what they do after class, not just deliver some English during the class. Okay? So it's a bit like Weight Watchers. Help them get their language life 
bigger, fatter in this case. One thing they can do, I mean, we call this peer motivation and nudging. With, with teenagers especially, but also with younger kids, they don't really pay much attention to what the teacher does. You've probably noticed that. They're not that interested. But what they are interested in is what the other kids in the class do. So if the other kids in the class are practicing outside class, doing some cool things, listening to songs, doing their homework, uh, writing some stuff, joining a group, whatever it is, they're kind of interested in that. What you can get them to do is plan their English week. So they put a few things in there. This is an adult student. She said coffee with Olga. So Olga's her friend. They've agreed to talk once a week over coffee in English. So they do it and they plan it. She's got English classes in there. She's got read the BBC website for 15 minutes. And in the practical consideration, she said set alarm. So she's got this idea that she will learn more English if she uh, does that. But she's thought about how to do it. I'll set the alarm because I have to go to work at 9. So at 8 or 8 15, I'll listen to the BBC or I'll read the site. Yeah. There's the English class and so on. The bottom one on Sunday is watch an episode of Mad Men in English. Why not? But again, these intentions fall by the wayside if we don't record them and talk about them. Yeah? Oh, yeah. The teachers, what we normally say is, yeah, go and watch some films in English. It's good practice. How many people tell their students to do that? Yeah? But how often do we ask them if they've actually seen any films, what films they've seen, and what English they learned from it? What I did with my students is um, we did this, and then every Monday morning, each once a week, they would come in, and there would be a 10-minute slot where they worked in pairs or groups of three, and they shared what they'd done or hadn't done. So they'd pull out their piece of paper with their kind of resolutions their week, and they'd go, well, I didn't do that. I never watched Mad Men because... And that conversation is fantastic because they celebrate what they have done. They get ideas from each other and get a little bit competitive. Wow. She did all these things. I didn't do anything. And also, they discuss they're in a game. Why didn't you watch Mad Men on Sunday? Well, my sister was having an argument with my mom, and then everyone got up. You know, it kind of talks about their lives and, and what stops them there. Or I watched the last episode, and it was really difficult, and I didn't understand it. Or have you tried watching with subtitles? No, how do you do that? Well, so the conversation goes like this. And, and the students start thinking about English, not as something as you, give them, but something that they are in charge of. And then you can celebrate that in public. That doesn't have to be a lot of time in class. If you want to be more ambitious, you can do something like Operation Success, where you have some, you can probably see those, can you, on the left? Can you read that? Yeah, okay different things the student's going to do. And what she wants to do is get 200 hours of English. Why? Because the Common European Framework says she needs 200 hours, more or less, to get from B1 to B2, something like that, yeah? So she's thinking, how am I going to do that in a year? Because students often say that, don't they? They say, well, I'm here and I want to get the first certificate. How do I get there? And she's listed some things like reading, watching films, doing exercises in a workbook, listening to songs, um, talking in English at work, writing emails, and so on. And then what she does is she kind of plans in a very meticulous way how many hours she's going to do that to get to a total of 200. She's got a head start because there's 90 hours of class if she goes every week for an hour and a half twice a week, 30 weeks, 90 hours. But then she's got some other time, so is she going to do that? So she can plan on a grand scale or a micro scale. This is more ambitious, I think, but... Again, for, for students who are motivated, it's not bad to do that at the beginning of the course because they can always adjust it after a term and say, well, what did you do, what didn't you do? It's really just the same as the, the weekly one. But Pause there for you to think. Those two things, the English week, planning like that, to talk to your partner. Would you do that with your students? Can you think it would be helpful to them? Think back to that student you talked about at the beginning. Yeah, maybe that's the best thing. That student we talked about, would this help them? Would it be possible and practical, yeah? Just for a couple of minutes.
We've got another acronym, the motivation ramp. And again, this is very relevant to coaching. And I started thinking, you know, people give up learning English and don't do stuff, but we succeed at stuff. So getting students to think about the things they do succeed at, not the things they fail at, may be a good model for them to succeed at English and for anything else. The RAMP stands for Relatedness, Agency, Mastery, and Purpose. Relatedness means doing stuff with other people, relating to other people. So if you go to a language class, you're going to get the relatedness. Or you meet your friend for coffee and talk English. This is relatedness here, yeah? You've come to a conference. You're not just reading a book at home. You're here. Hello? Somebody else is watching... Watching Madonna videos over there, maybe. Yeah, look. Has she got the cone bar on? Get into the groove. Right. Uh, agency means who decides. The idea being that if we're relating and we have agency, we decide stuff, not somebody else, then we're more likely to do it. So if I decide to give up smoking, I'm more likely to do it than someone saying you have to give up smoking. And of course, that works with language classes as well, doesn't it? The students like to choose what they want to do. Yeah? You've all got to do exercise three. is isn't as motivating as you can choose. If you prefer to do, those of you who prefer to do exercise three, do that. And those who prefer exercise four, do that. It's a very minor piece of agency, but it helps. But it can be extended. Yeah? You can do some grammar gap fills for your homework, or you can take your mobile phone and record yourself speaking for a minute, or you can watch this or watch that. So they get a choice. That's the idea of agency. Mastery is knowing you're getting better. This often happens with students, what, what we call it, the intermediate plateau. They say, well, I've been doing this English class for a year, and I'm not any better. Or at least I don't think I'm any better. Yeah? That happens to us all, doesn't it? And it probably happens to Djokovic as well. You know, how, how do you get better? Uh, so you need kind of ways of measuring that. So, for example, if the teacher can say, well, you remember we made a video of you talking English back in September. Let's have a look at that video. What do you think of that person? Oh, yeah, I'm better than that one on the video. Or here's some stuff you wrote on the first day of term. Now look at what you wrote last time for homework, etc. So mastery is that idea of getting better. For the Weight Watchers, it's seeing your weight is going down. She incidentally, my girlfriend doesn't seem to believe in. She says, oh, I'm, I put on weight. And I said, well, how much did you weigh before and how much do you weigh now? She said, I don't know. So I've just put on weight. So she won't, she won't, she won't weigh herself. But, <laughs> I, but that's all I do. I just weigh. And that's it. The scales don't lie, do they? Well, it's kind of an excuse. Have I just drunk a load of water and stuff? And there's different scales in the gym to the ones at home. And purpose is something to do. In this case, this is um, uh, actually a text uh, from Dan about doing, preparing for a half marathon, to run a half marathon. So his purpose was to run the half marathon. Students have purposes like visiting England and being understood, passing their exams, and so on like that. These are purposes, yeah? The idea is if you've got the ramp there, you're more likely to succeed. When you don't succeed or when your students don't succeed, it's probably because one of these things is missing. Yeah? I wanted to practice my English, but I didn't have anyone to practice with. Relatedness, yeah? Me and my friend, we go to the bar and we practice every week and we speak English, but I don't know if we're progressing. What's missing? Purpose. They need to kind of say, well, we're going to go to this thing where there's other people speaking English and see how we do. Uh, or something like that. Go and watch a film. Yeah? Agency. Yeah, you're just being told what to do. I've got to do this because the school says. The teacher says. The school says. No agency then. It's less, it, it, that may be the reason it doesn't succeed. You've got relatedness. You've got a purpose, but there's no agency. You just feel like you're a hamster on a wheel doing what the teacher tells you or what the school tells you.
apologise for this. It seemed to be that it was going to be big enough. This is called Mission Impossible, or Mission Not Impossible. And it's another way, uh, an activity you can do or your students can do. Basically, there's seven days of the week there, Monday to Sunday, and there's a little task or challenge for the student to do for each day, yeah? For example, it says on Friday, uh, read a website in English for five minutes, yeah? And on Wednesday, it says listen to a song in English, or two very short ones, try to understand the lyrics. So it gives little kind of challenges to the students to do during their week, one day every week, yeah. Even Sunday, it says no rest today, but something easy. Watch YouTube clips for five minutes in English, any ones you like. Point here isn't the task. It doesn't really matter what students do. Learning English is a bit like becoming a pilot. It's just doing lots of miles. You know, pilots have to do air miles. Well, Djokovic just has to do loads of time on court. There's no way around that. That's how he became good. He practiced a lot. And that's how, he, that's how you've learned English. And it doesn't matter too much what you're doing, as long as it's more or less challenging, obviously, but you know how to do that. Again, we fuss a lot about, well, what are they doing with the YouTube clips? Do they have comprehension questions? Um, will they know which one to choose? It doesn't really matter. If they can spend five minutes in English, so what if it's a bit difficult or a bit easy? They'll work that out themselves. The point is getting the habits of doing stuff in English, yeah? So it's a mission not impossible. And students can then set themselves challenges. So again, each week they can set little challenges for each other. They even send messages. You know, on Monday morning they send the message, or the teacher could send it out. You probably don't have WhatsApp groups with young learners, but with older learners you could. And you could actually do this in real time. So the teacher, your, your mobile phone pings on Monday morning and your teacher has set you a little challenge, yeah, to do in English that costs five or ten minutes. That kind of thing. And then the students can set them each other. So you get in the habit. Lots and lots of practice. It's all about the hours, 200 hours, 400 hours. Don't worry too much about what you do. If you think your students are not very autonomous or they're a bit worried or about ideas, you can prompt them with ideas like this. So recording yourself is obviously a good way of practicing English. Yeah? And you've got the tech, you've got the mobile phone in your pocket. You get it out and you make a video of yourself or audio recording speaking English. It's not rocket science, is it? But for some students, they might think, well, I don't know, why should I do that? What, what will I talk about? And again, this just gives you a procedure. It says, talk about this, press record, listen to it, do it again, show it to someone else if you want, that kind of thing. So it's a supportive procedure if you think the students are going to be a little bit lost with that kind of stuff. And the same with listening to a song. Again, we often say, go watch films, go listen to songs. But there are some students in your class who are thinking, what do you mean listen to a song? I don't know. I don't understand the lyrics. What's the point of me listening? So they need a little bit of support, a framework, yeah? The routine, which they can obviously deviate from afterwards. But it gives you steps, you know? Choose the song, listen to it, find the lyrics in Serbian if you can, look at the translation, etc., etc., And then a sort of do more with others thing at the end. Yeah, talk to your friend about the song you listen to, that kind of thing. So these are sort of supportive structures to help students have agency. And these can actually be homework. Homework doesn't have to be filling gaps, distinguishing the present perfect and the simple past, or comparative structures or whatever it is we give them for homework. They can do this for homework. Or maybe they can choose. Listen to a song, or do the grammar exercise. Writing as well. I mean, that's something very easy to do in public now. You can actually write on restaurant reviews, uh, YouTube. You can do that kind of stuff. And again, there's a procedure for them to do that. And obviously, they can write to their friends on WhatsApp as well. You can adapt this procedure uh, for social media. Especially, do you have WhatsApp here or something similar? Yeah? What? Viagra? Viagra? No. Oh, Viber. <laughs> okay. Anyway, you're, all your friends and uh, the students are all on this group with their friends and Vibra. Yeah? 
they could do this, <laughs> they could do this sort of stuff there, couldn't they? Um, pause to think about that. We've looked at some ideas for ways to support. Would, are these ideas that you think that student would need? Going back again to the student you thought about at the beginning. Are these kind of things that would help that student? Or are there other things? Yeah, things we talked about, like giving them tasks, talking to them about motivation. So the conversation about why aren't you doing your homework maybe involves the ramp. Yeah? Uh, anything since then. So again, two minutes with your partner. Talk about that, how you would apply it to that student, if you would. Two questions I got here. First one, yeah. Um, how many students do you have in your class? I don't actually teach classes at the moment. I'm kind of managing a school, so I don't have a regular class. Today I have about 390 students in my class. <laughs> when I do teach in a language school, sometimes there are 10 students in the class. When I worked in China with teachers, there were 80 students in the class. In my school, uh, it's a private language school. The typical amount of students in a class is eight. However, I think what's behind the question is, well, you can do that with eight students, but you can't do it with 36 students or 34. I think you can. I think you can cascade and, and, and make these changes, a lot of these changes here. You can't do them as much, of course. Djokovic has one coach for him. But if that coach worked with Djokovic and Federer and lots of other, he would still achieve something. It's the same as teaching. Yep. Exactly. I think a coach can work with, what tennis coaches do, my daughter has tennis lessons. Oh, another question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what did I say? My daughter has a tennis coach, and maybe there's 10 or 15 of them. But his job is to see how each one can progress and think about where they're going with their tennis and set them goals and give them tournaments and matches and activities that make them feel better. Wow. There's loads now. God, can we go on an extra five minutes then? Is that... So, okay. So you might be getting hungry though, mightn't you? Okay. Okay. This question is more profound, and I, I don't know how to answer it really. It's kind of an existential question. Maybe it says, will we get a handout? I don't know what to say. I mean, this is like the student who drew a picture of God. I don't know what to say. Um, I can say that the, um, this presentation, the slides, I don't like using lots of paper. That's a personal kind of foible I have. Yes, I will give you, so um, maybe Lisa has a way of posting it, or you can email me individually. I don't mind that. Except if all 390 of you do, but I doubt that will happen. There are some cards here. At the end, if you want to take a card, you can which has my email address on. It will also be on a slide here. So you can ask me or Lisa will post them on, her, on the website for you all. Okay? So that deals with that. Let me just see if we've got any others. Especially if some of the writing was so small. I regret that, but now I think it's good. It's left you with a taste for a bit more, isn't it? You want to know what that little writing says. So I'm going to convert that into a victory. How many students we did? How do you motivate students to study if they don't want to learn English and are there just to please their parents? Well, please, I'm a parent and I don't think there's anything wrong with trying to please your parents. 
I'm always trying to please my kids, so why shouldn't they try and please me? So I think you can talk them round. Remember what we said about the ramp? Relatedness, agency, mastery, purpose. Work those things. The point is you can't, uh, coaching can answer that question uh, rather than just giving up and saying, well, they're not motivated or they're only here because they're mum and dad. There's always a way. And especially for students here. I work in Spain. Spain is a very, Spanish is a very big language in the world. And a lot of the students, I think, are less motivated to learn English because a lot of people in the world speak Spanish. That's the math of it. The same in England. In England and Ireland, they are the worst language learners in the whole of Europe for this reason. In Serbia, your language isn't so widely spoken, so everybody is very motivated. They know that their future will include English and maybe German and maybe other languages. So you have a big advantage, believe me. If you want to work in Spain, that would be all your students. Ah, oh, can you see the other one's the same? That's the cover of the ebook. Remember I mentioned at the beginning? You can go on Amazon or a place called Smashwords, which is not big and evil like Amazon. And it's actually a little bit cheaper. And you can click, and for about five euros, you can have the whole thing. All of the money from this, if you buy it, the money goes to a charity for cystic fibrosis. Because Dan's daughter suffers from that condition, and we decided that's what we would do. So believe me, it's well spent. But if you don't want to spend it, just get your friend to do it, and then copy her download and... For five euros, 390 people can have the book. The wonders. There is also a website called Learning, Learner Coaching, ELT.wordpress. Dan and I have stopped updating that, but there's stuff from the last three or four or five years there uh, that may interest you. Um, some of the things you've seen in the slides, some discussion about those things, and some posts from guests about coaching. Okay? And as I say, if you're really interested in pursuing this further or finding out more, you can email me. Okay? as well. Jack could mention this being a good selfie opportunity, and I'm going to take it because I have never done this before, but I want to do it now. I want to take a selfie of me with all you guys in the background, just to freak out my girlfriend. And So when I, um, problem is it's going to now take me ages to, oh, look at that. I've got to unblock it. There we go. Bear with me. Old man with mobile phone. What could go wrong? So when I say now, you're going to stand up and wave and kind of 